Um, I'm very pleased that um, Professor Vera Krishik could be with us tonight. She's an extension specialist and associate professor in the University of Minnesota Entomology Department. She's also director of the Center for Sustainable Urban, Urban Ecosystems. Her research interests include conservation biocontrol, insecticide toxicity and pesticide use and safety, as well as extensive work in integrated pest management for landscape and greenhouses. She actively partners with state and local groups to manage pesticide use. Please welcome Dr. Krishik. Well, I'm really happy to come talk to you. I mean, I love sharing information about bugs and how to manage them and how to keep the good bugs at bay and let the good bugs that we all want to see, dragonflies, lady beetles, bees, butterflies live. And it's getting easier and easier. The EPA is registering all these biorational insecticides and they do come available to consumers, but they usually start uh, with the industry and then within 10 years they're available to consumers. So we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. I know you worked with Jeff Hahn for years. I've been here as long as him, uh, but you guys never see me. So I know now that he's retired, I get to visit with you, but the Dakota Mount Ca County Master Gardeners I have visited all through the years. So thank you very much for inviting me. So today I wanna to talk to you about IPM programs, some of the emerging pests and how to manage them so you can conserve good bugs and pollinators. I'm just gonna use the word pollinator for now on, but when I say that, I mean anything that is a good bug, whether it's a charismatic dragonfly or it's a ladybird beetle, or it's a butterfly of some sort, or if it's a beneficial insect that attacks emerald ash borer. It's just easier if I just use the word pollinator to mean a good bug. You know, 160 million years ago, um, the angiosperms evolved from the conifers. The cycads, the magnolias were the first plants to make flowers, the magnolias. They have a stroboli in the center, just like a pine cone. And when they started evolving, and some of you may not want to admit this, but think about it hard, the only reason why we have flowers is because of bees. Bees, um, through coevolution, the plants adapted to the fact that the bees would first take their pollen. Cycads had lots of pollen and they'd move them to other plants. And if any of you have had a Benjamin fig in your house, they're not as popular now as they were 20 years ago, you'd see all little, on the edge of the leaf, a little circle, that was sugar. Physiologists thought for a long time it was just the plant getting rid of excess sugar, but we figured out it was actually the plant was making these extra floral nectaries to bring the good bugs in the pollinators, uh, so they would keep, stay on the plant. So that is a co-evolution, those extra floral nectaries. Cotton plants have them, citrus plants have them. So when the gymnosperms first evolved and the cycads and the conifers start involved in the angiosperms, magnolia being the earliest angiosperm, the insects were all there. All the orders were already on land, they just radiated. So 99% of all insects are good, even mosquitoes, have a place in nature. Fish eat mosquitoes to survive in the water, mosquito larvae. So we consider them bad if they compete with us for flowers or leaf surface or in agriculture yield. But just remember all insects evolve, they need pollen and nectar, 99% are good. It's just, we have to deal with those pests that compete with us. So we're gonna kind of talk about that, but I wanted to give you the historical perspective on what is a pest. So I want you to understand from my lecture that this idea of taxonomy, you know, Linnaeus in, 19, in 1776 was the first one to make a book on taxonomy where every living creature on earth had a genus and a species and they were in a ranking of order based on morphological characters. Today we use DNA, of course. And so here are some pictures of beetles. And the first four pictures starting from the left going right those are all in the family Chrysomelidae, which means shield bearer. So they have that thick outer wing that covers their under wings. So the outer wings open, the under wings come out and they fly rather poorly, but they do fly. And then look at their antennae. And I'm gonna use my cursor here. They all have these filiform antennae, which means even segment. All of them do. And this one, these are corn rootworms, Colorado potato beetle, asparagus beetle. They're in the family Chrysomelidae. This is Japanese beetle and look at said antennae. Now, 
those of you who can tell cars apart, I can tell insects apart, I can't tell cars apart, but it's the same thing, the morphological characters. You look at this body form and you can tell it's not quite the same, but it's these antennae, these clubbed antennae that tell you it's a scarab beetle. So from my talk, if you get anything, I want you to know that to do IPM, to conserve pollinators, you have to be able to identify a bee from a wasp, a good pollinator from a wasp. Not that wasps are bad. Wasps love to eat larvae of insects. It's just if they're in the lawn or somewhere and the kid or the dog might step on it, they're very dangerous and you have to eliminate them. But if they're out in a woodlot or up in a tree, you just have to learn not to go near where their nest is. But insect evolution is very conservative. I have that in blue here. And so if you can identify something, the corn rootworms, the Colorado potato beetle, the asparagus beetle, they all have the same life history. So that ability of an insect to go from a lar larval to an adult stage and feed on different parts of the plant, we call life history. And so if you get anything about my lecture that you have to know the good from the bad, I'm not gonna say ugly because there are no ugly insects. And that is what you need to do proper IPM. So let's move on here. I have created over the last 24 years, tons of resources that no one knows exist. And so I'm really happy to come talk to you. Um, every time I give a talk, my visitors go up 100 a month. So I'm going for almost to 1,000 a month visitors. They are very good websites. I'm gonna to talk to you about some of them today. So just to get us at the same speed, this is a backyard for people. You see, it's beautiful. Everyone would like to look out their kitchen window, look out on their deck and see this, the organization, the beautiful thick turf, the flower beds, the plants in the background, the structure here, every garden needs structure, a cement structure to define it. And here's a fence around it to define your space. And look at this nice little organization on the bottom of those conifers. And here's a fire pit and a sitting wall. This uh, really is very endearing to all of us, but this is what bugs want. They want re rank growth, plants that grow into each other that they can hide in, under a rainstorm. They love vines, flowering vines, whether it's a clematis, um, anything you can get out there, uh, drop more scallop, honeysuckle. They love to get nectar and pollen from vines because they make so many flowers. Uh, also um, the heirloom plants, I don't believe that you all should just go out and plant native plants. A lot of these area loom plants have been around for hundreds of years and they do provide good pollen and nectar. And here's a bench for you, but look at all this growth, you know, raucous growth touching each other, plant, insects like plants are touching each other. They can see the color of the flowers better. So this is a backyard for insects. Sometimes when you go to the store, I go to Menards all the time and these bee boxes showed up. And so I tried it out at four uh, parks. I put up bee boxes in an experiment and all of them were occupied at the end of one season. And these are the places these stem nesting bees go into. And uh, the only thing you have to do is you have to buy packets. And every year you have to take out of the structure these little tiny different size um, pieces of wood, different diameter, and replace them because you get the buildup of pathogens in there. And unlike birds who come to a nest box and throw everything out, uh, bees don't do that. So the other thing in this discussion I want you to realize about pollinators is David Attenborough has the most wonderful two videos that are available on Amazon. You can get his version of the hummingbirds and on Netflix, there's something called Dancing Birds about the birds of paradise. And we love hummingbirds in our garden and hummingbirds are gonna to start to disappear. The reason why hummingbirds come north is they need the, uh, they need sap suckers to make holes in the trees. So when the sap suckers migrate back north, the hummingbirds come with them and they visit these trees. Sap suckers are almost endangered. They're on the least number of species list, the least number. And without them, we do not have native plants with red flowers for hummingbirds. And so you have to put up um, you know, artificial feeders. So if you retrofit your backyard, um, for me, don't get so concerned about all those prairie plants. Think about food plants for insect and hummingbirds and other taxa like that. One of the things I wanna to talk to you about is the use of the neonicotinoid insecticides. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. 
if you put it in a rose plant and here's a mega chylid, it comes along and it cuts out this beautiful C-shaped. It takes that to a wall or the ground. It puts in the leaf some pollen and then it lays an egg on it and it rolls it up and sticks it in those stems we were just looking at. And if you use a systemic insecticide, when that little larvae hatches out of that egg, takes some nice juicy leaf to eat, it's going to die. So just remember, systemic insecticides are not, for many reasons, compatible with uh, bees in the garden. The other things I want to point out to you, which I said in my introduction, is here are some scary wasps, ground nesting wasps. They actually have these wasps. Their job in life are guard wasps. They just sit at the entrance. It's ontological at different times in their life, different ages. And, but we also have ground nesting bees. So it's really important for you to be able to tell the difference. And here's our stem nesting bees. If you see a rose like this, um, it's really hard for bees to get into that pollen and nectar, um, but it's better to use, we're gonna talk about some insecticides that won't harm bees. So I have all these resources. If you've just put my name into Google, you can come up with some of these. There's two websites. This pollinator conservation has a whole section, cooperation with Heather Holmes on pictures from her books to help you to identify the difference uh, between the stem nesting bees and the social bum bumblebees and different taxa like that. This other one has a bunch of online courses and has a lot of information on IPM. It's more geared towards the professional people I deal with rather than consumers because with the way we split it for good 25 years was Jeff worked with consumers and I worked with professionals. So this website is being discontinued, but this is what the pollinator conservation biocontrol. Here's the little buttons. I've written 15 extension leaflets for you. So none of this is on the extension site. That's a discussion another time, how extension puts information on their site. But the Bee Lab has a site, I have a site. Um, people over in horticulture do apples. We all have our own sites where we add information. And this pollinator and beneficial insect portion, that's where Heather Holmes has these beautiful pictures for you. And then there's talks about our research and there's a resource center. So this is just uh, us. There's like 28 families of bees and wasps here. Here's the mega chylids we were just talking about. Common name, mason bee. They were the ones cutting out that leaf from the roses. Here they're going, they sometimes nest on the ground. Sometimes they nest in wood or stems. And here is a ground nesting bee, a halictid, a common green sweat bee. And so, you know, these things are gonna show up in bee lawn. So when you deal as master gardeners with your clientele, you need to make sure you tell them there's a difference between a bee and a wasp, that they're gonna start nuking these ground nesting bees, which is the purpose of the bee lawn. Remember, you can't use herbicides on a bee lawn. You're gonna kill your bee flowers and you can't use, um, insecticides because you're going to kill your bees. So a lot of work there for us to figure out how to manage insects on bee lawns. So here are the worst wasps. They're not here in Minnesota, but everyone likes to be scared. And there are these huge Asian hornets. And look, they're picking up baby larvae little honeybees and crushing them. It's all very sad. They think they have them in control. They're from Asia. That's where honeybees are from. So these were biocontrol in Asia of honeybees, but we don't want them in the country. And luckily we don't have them here, but look at those jaws, holy mackerel. Holy mackerel, I even say holy mackerel. Here's some pictures of them. They show up every now and then and they're the Washington state, but look at these mouth parts. Ooh, there's the eyes, there's the ocelli, but here's the mandibles, this makes it again. It makes it in the hymenoptera. It has an elbowed antennae. All hymenoptera have elbowed antennae. All right, so why do we care about IPM and pesticides? Well, I luckily was on the Fish and Wildlife book, two white papers they did, one on Rusty Patch Bumblebee and one on um, Monarch Butterfly. And uh, you can go Google this, um, and they talk about how Rusty Patch Bumblebee and Monarchs are affected by habitat destruction and pesticides. But I have this on here because Master Gardeners, it's going to be your job. This happened a couple of times in across the Twin Cities where landscapers took a picture 
And so to see this down here, this bee to watch, you can take a picture of a bumblebee or any bee in your backyard, send it off to Bumblebee Watch, and they'll help you figure out the species. Well, somebody did that, a landscaper, and lo and behold, he had rusty patch bumblebee. If you find rusty patch bumblebee, it's an endangered species. You no longer can manage that landscape without working with the DNR and MDA on a management plan. So that's going to be your gut job when you have get contact contacted by homeowners who say there's issues because uh, uh, endangered species, endangered rusty patch bumblebee has been found. It's a real issue. And so they have to, the landscaper then has to stop the management and work with the DNR and MDA on how to come up with a management plan. Good idea, I think. All right, so let's go on. This is the IPM website. Again, I usually work with nurseries and landscape and greenhouse, but I love talking to you guys because you're out there in nurseries, greenhouses, talking to people, spreading the word, reduce pesticide usage, save the bug. So I'm really happy to be here. And so this has tons of information about pesticides. I have a book, Jeff had a book. Well, I wrote a book too. You don't know about my book, but it's been online for a good 15 years. And you just click on any one of these links and there's 300 species you get. We're gonna show some pictures later on and it gives you the life history. It gives you the pesticide to use, when to manage them. Um, and again, I use this with my professional clients. There's things like this here, Think IPM poster to download and print. Um, my butterfly gardening booklet won an award uh, from the Horticultural Society two years ago for best extension publication. It's all about bee life history, uh, pollinator, uh, bu butterfly life history, stuff you wouldn't necessarily see in a bulletin. And you know, you just have to remember I wrote that bulletin in 1998. And so this is the update in 2020, and I'm very proud of it. It is really, really good about introducing um, information, what pesticides to use and not to use, and um, about all, it has the list of all the bees, sorry, all the butterflies in Minnesota, and has tells you about what they're doing when you see them flying. You know, as you see them zipping along like this, right? And all of a sudden they go up like this, and then two of them start tumbling, that's two males mating two males fighting over mating, there's a female somewhere. And so all those behaviors, you see them sitting in the sun going like this, they're warming up. So there's so many behaviors that they do that you've seen, but you haven't probably had the time to contemplate, very Buddhist, contemplate why they're doing what they're doing. So this book explains it all, why they're doing what they're doing. So it's online. And here's just some information about what is IPM, the different parts of IPM, and how we need to first inspect and monitor, use weather to forecast when you're gonna have pest problems. Threshold, you don't wanna spray just a few bugs because the good bugs may control the bad bugs, so you wanna wait. Um, education on the difference between bad bugs and good bugs and record keeping. So next year you come back and this is just a reminder about our endangered species and you as master gardeners, if you have some people that have endangered species, they have to manage differently. All right, so that information is there. You know, I see you once every three years for 45 minutes. I can't possibly keep you up with everything that's going on about IPM and landscapes, but those websites can. So please visit them and help me get up to 800, maybe a thousand by the end of the summer. So what is pollinator conservation? So use contact insecticides. Don't use systemics like imidacloprid. Uh, for one reason, it gets into the leaves and affects the bees that use leaves. It gets into the pollen and nectar. Bees are very sensitive. So um, believe me, this is real. When I started doing this research 20 years ago, people would say, no, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Even Jeff said that. But now I've been vindicated. Everybody says the same thing. European Union has banned all these neonics, and now they just came out with a press release that all these exemptions that chemical companies are asking for, they're not going to allow them anymore. So this is a real deal. Do not, number two, don't use systemics. Three, plant a seasonal phenology of native and heirloom plants. Heirloom plants make lots of pollen and nectar. Don't use double plants. They're no good. Number four, only use single flowered plants, not double. When they breed for a double plant, they take the parts that make pollen and they make another 
flower petal out of it. Yeah, that's a whole nother lecture, right? Provide overwintering habitat, don't kill queen bees, because you kill the queen, a solitary bee, oops, that individual is gone from the population, population will minus one. Same thing with a bumblebee, you kill it, that's it. There's no more bees gonna be produced that summer. Understand the different types of bees and wasps, and that's why Heather Holmes helped me make that beautiful section for you. All right, so here it is in the cliff notes. And again, you're gonna be managing bee lawns to help people. You can't use herbicides anymore. You can't use insecticides. Wow, what are you gonna do? Well, we have some tools for you on how to manage grubs in bee lawns that we're gonna to talk, to talk to you about. So use contact insecticides, don't use neonics. 20 years of research. I signed a paper in two years ago, uh, 800 scientists signed it around the world. I signed it that um, people, countries should consider banning the neonics like the European Union did. If you want that, I can send it to you. That letter came from uh, Goulson in, in uh, the United Kingdom. Don't use fungicides um, on a lawn without diagnosis. A lot of people think these little patches on your lawn, these little brown patches are grubs of Japanese beetle. Nope, those are fungi, but fungi are very specific to certain chemicals. Not every chemical works, so you have some chlorothalonitrophil. Uh, it's not going to work on everything. And promote bee lawns. All right, so paradigm shift. Now, this is different. Sometimes you get talks from a different unit of the university, and they tell you that glyphosate is not harmful, and I'm going to tell you the opposite. And this is the scientific world. We get data, and people present it, and we change our mind when we get enough data. So the data is coming in. 2018 in PNAS, a very prestigious journal, glyphosate alters bee gut flora biota, biota. So all those people who are eating yogurt to get their microbes up, so to make their immune system strong, uh, glyphosate. Glyphosate was first registered as an antibiotic, not a herbicide. Wow. So it kills the fungi and the bacteria in the bee guts. Another paper in 2015, it affects bee navigation. Another one in affects larval development in 2018. Every year more come out. So those bee lawns, you not only can't use herbicides because they are going to kill the bee flowers, but you can't use them because they're going to affect the bees. So rethink that one. All right, systemic insecticides. Um, again, uh, the neonics are the major ones we have. Fipronil is another one. It wasn't registered, um, but uh, this is the basic French, French Sanchez Biles from Australia in 2015. He put this in the prestigious journal Science to explain to you how on sunflowers, where the French beekeepers in 1996 first went to Paris up in arms with signs saying these neonicotinoids are causing mad bee disease. And it literally took 20 years for the European Union to ban them and we have not banned them and will not ban them. That's another discussion. But what happens is you put it as a seed treatment, it gets into the soil, 80 to 90% of it stays in the soil, only two to 20 gets taken into the plant. It not only gets the leaves, gets into pollen and nectar, but you have the indirect effects that you're reducing the number of flying insects that feed on the pollen and nectar. Remember what we learned the first time we met, 99% of all good bugs need pollen and nectar. And so it has this direct effect on birds. Numerous papers in the Netherlands um, show a direct correlation between systemic neonic use and bird decline um, because of there's less insects. You've heard of an insect apocalypse? Well, if you eat insects, it's not a good thing for your insects to be declining. All right, so remember, it either is a seed treatment or you put it on the roots or you put it, spray it on the leaves, it doesn't matter, it all gets into pollen and nectar. So just remember, it takes a little longer if you put it in the ground, but it's all gonna end up in the leaves and pollen and nectar at very, very high rates. I have numerous papers on this, and if you wanna bring me back and just talk about neonics, we can, but I just wanna mention it in my journey. So when you see this B label, you see this little B on a label, it really doesn't tell you the whole story because it's only on, neonics that are used on foliar applications. So if you go to the store and you find a bare product and you're using it as a soil drench, either the granules or the liquid, they don't have to have this bee label then. 
Interesting, isn't it? Even though it does the same thing, even worse, higher levels when you put it into soil. So be aware of these issues with neonicotinoids. Now, to get to our next phase, I have to go over this chart with you. And I know it's evening and um, we're here having fun, but we have to do this. So this is a basic table and this is a basic line. And this line tells you the effect of this parameter on that parameter. We call this the X and that the Y axis. So the concentration of a pesticide, and this is how many individuals it kills. I don't know why they have people in this diagram. We're not trying to kill people. We're trying to kill bugs. So it's kind of weird, but anyway. So you have this line here and lines are usually never straight. They usually are sigmoid in shape. And so what you see here, we have something called the TD50 or the LC50. That's when 50% 50, 50 of the population is killed. And this is a relative measure for us to look at the toxicity of a chemical. So I'm gonna say that again, it's a relative measure. So if you have a neonic, that LC50 is gonna be really low. If it doesn't kill bugs, it's gonna be high. So I have put together, and I do this every year, update it with any new chemical, and this will tell you the toxicity to honeybees. And it tells you the LC50, there's TL50, TC50, TD50, LC50, LD50. So the least though dose to 50% of the population. And remember it says to honeybees because the EPA generates this data, it's harder to find it on other beneficial insects like butterflies and things. But here it tells you if it's highly toxic and look, all the neonicotinoids are highly toxic, either if they're a foliar, a seed treatment or a root dredge. And in the gray areas, insect growth regulators are not toxic. You get an X in the first. So this is on the website and this should be your guide. It's in most of my bulletins to explain to you what you can use in your backyard to conserve bees. So I get questions about this all the time. Do I need an organic program for my landscape? There is no such thing as an organic program. Organic only has to do with the food you eat. But the EPA has registered many biorational insecticides that are compatible with bees. And that's what you wanna be purchasing. A conventional insecticide is one with a low LD50. It's very toxic to bees. So just remember, you're looking for these biorationals. Organic is completely different. OMRI means the Organic Materials Research Institute. It has a little logo and it is a chemical that's allowed, a natural product that's allowed for organic management. And we do not have many of those for landscapes. So, this is just information on how, where the organic program came from. It's a federal design program that is moderated by every state. And so in Minnesota, if you wanna go and take your farmland, convert it to, from conventional to organic, um, you have to have a certain guidelines. They have to be inspected every year for about seven years before you can produce food that's organic. It's a really big deal. It's a really big deal. And it's amazing that we have so many producers doing this for us. So I just want you to make sure that you understand here are OMRI, Organic Materials Research Institute approved. So it can be approved for organic management, but you can always use them in your backyard too. But because it's organic, it doesn't mean it's not gonna kill bees. That is the issue here. So some of these products will kill bees and you have to be careful, pyrethrins, are HT, highly toxic to bees. So it is an organically approved, OMRI approved insecticide, but it is not a biorational, it kills bees. So you need to go back to that table. So characteristics of biorationals, short residual, they degrade by light, by heat, by water. They work on small insects that immature. They're there for three days and then they're gone. They're less harmful to our pollinators and good bugs. They're not harmful to you or the cat or dog. They may take a little longer, but they do a good job killing pests. So just remember BT kills, it's a stomach poison. Um, we've had BT Christaki around for a good 20 years, but here's the new product for you to use Japanese beetle in your bee lawn, BT Galleria, Bee Gone. Sorry, BT Galleria, Grub Gone. And this one is, you. So you can't use systemic insecticides like culprit, but you can use this. 
or you can use the new GrubX, and the new GrubX has a chemical in it called chal chlorothaminitripol, which is very non-toxic to bees, but it kills monarch butterflies. So, but usually in bee lawns, we don't have hosts for monarch butterflies. All right, so that was a windfall through pollinator conservation. So habitat, plant the right plants, manage with biorationals, not necessarily organic pesticides, biorational ones. And now we're gonna apply this. So now this is the fun, the case study. So I'm at 7.30, I have about 15 more minutes maybe. And so let's talk about the case studies, what you need to do. And what is IPN? Here's our beautiful bee lawn. And we don't wanna go back to this anymore, right? We wanna have diversity in our lawns. And here's some suggestions of plants, but as I said, you can't use herbicides. You have to be really careful what insecticides you use. All right, so I'm gonna skip three slides and I wanna to go to this one. So here's the biorational insecticides that we're gonna talk about now with case studies. Here is the Celeprim. Its trade name is chlorothalonitropole. It's active ingredient. It's in the chemical Grubex. Spinosad is available for you in garden centers. It's really good at killing caterpillars and sawflies. Neem oil, soaps and oils are really good. They're only there for three days. But when you have a borer, you need something to penetrate the bark. And unfortunately, you're gonna need a systemic insecticide like imidacloprid, a dinotifuran for that. So let's talk briefly about Japanese beetles. It's got here in 1916. Here's stages of the grubs. They're always the C-shaped. The adults, this is a mating ball. They feed gregariously on flowers and they create this mating balls. And the, the way you tell if you have a fungus or a Japanese beetle is if you pull back the turf and it comes off, it's, ja it's Japanese beetle because they eat the roots. A uh, fungus, everything will be like wet and mushy and you'll see little pictums, which are their little spores. So here we go. So you go out there and you see uh, in the landscape, you see uh, grubs. Grubs have no legs. This has no legs. This is Japanese beetle, it does have legs. So I just want you to know that this use of morphological characters helps you identify the family, the scarab beetle, and here, I, oh, you can't see their antennae, but they have that club antennae. This is what all the scarab grubs look like. And how do you tell the difference? You look at their butts and they have hairs on their butt. And that's a whole nother talk, but we can understand the 10 different species of scarab by the hairs on their butt here. But what happens if you see something without legs? Well, it is a weevil of some kind. And we have two weevils in the landscape. We have a bluegrass billbug that eats the crown of bluegrass and we have black vine weevil that comes in nursery pots. So these are the how IPM works. You have to first identify the pest because I'm gonna tell you Bavaria fungus, which is a biorational, kills these really well in the garden, but it doesn't work on Japanese beetle. So that's why identification is so important. So here's Japanese beetle. Um, they're probably not going to be a lot this year because we had a drought last year and they can't take drought, the larvae die, so it's probably good. Feed on over 300 species of plant. Here is a linden in uh, uh, 10 days. This is what it goes from that to that, that. All right, so here's a Japanese beetle trap. Here's the trap. Here's the lures it has. This is the germano, which is arrayed from geraniums and a little rose in there. This is a septa that the pheromone the chemical that they use to call each other. This is just an old, another kind. You don't wanna use this. It, this is the hanger. Just walk away from this because it brings too many into your backyard. This is not gonna help you manage Japanese beetle. This is gonna make Japanese beetle a problem in your landscape. All right, so Japanese beetle, no more neonicotinoids. We wanna use these things called um, a celeprin. It's in Scott's Grubex. Its active ingredient is chlorothanonitropol and it's bee friendly. You can use this on bee lawn. So bingo, we have a biorational. Is this approved for organic management? No, because this is a chemical. It's not a natural product. To be approved for organic management, it has to be a natural product. Here's this grub gone, this Bacillus thuringiensis that's been approved. And it's called BT Galleria grub gone. 
every year you have to buy it online. Uh, it runs out because everybody buys it because it really works. All right. So Japanese Beetle, the Department of Ag had a program. They released a fly and a wasp. Here's the wasp called Tiffia vernalis. This is what the wasp looked like. Here's a wasp. So you can see its ventral side. And they would go through the grass, through the um, crown of the grass. They would find the grubs. And they actually lay their eggs on different species. Where I come from in Maryland, this is common. You see them flitting over the lawn at night looking for Japanese beetle. This did not work. They were released by the Department of Ag. It did not work um, in around 2000. The other things, so this wasp, it feeds on nectar and pollen of plants. In China, it worked around um, streams, but it doesn't work very well in the United States. Then the Department of Ag released this. It's a fly, it looks like a house fly. It's called Isoceta aldrichii, and it uh, needs pollen and nectar again, and it lays eggs. Sometimes you see a Japanese beetle with a little white egg on, right behind the eyes. Um, that doesn't manage them either. But we have a grant right now, and we're looking at this native fungus called Ovovesicula stictospora, and we're, oh, sorry, Ovovesicula populi, and another one called stictospora. We're not looking at that one. We're trying to do the research with this one. And it's a native fungus that lives in the soil in the east. And we are releasing it into the nursery sites around Minnesota to get it established. And it, in, a, in a study in Michigan for the last 20 years, it reduced winter survival by 20 to 50%. And the grubs lay about 50% fewer eggs. And in 15 years, there's 75% less Japanese beetles. So people have always wondered why Japanese beetle introduced in 1916 in the East. Um, all of a sudden, you don't find it, and it ends up this ovovesicular fungus in the soil. It has no toxicity to us. It cannot affect us, but this is very toxic. So we're working on a program to get this established here. All right, so let's take our IPM and talk more about natives versus exotics. And people think, well, if it's a native, I don't have to manage it, but you do. Some natives get, uh, get higher population size. Usually the exotics, like Japanese beetle, they come from someplace else, they're invasive exotics, but lots of times native ones. So here, up here, we have Tarabda. This is a tax goldenrod. Um, it's suppressed by ants eat the eggs, so it's a native unless you have a lot of goldenrod um, and look at defoliation, that may be the only way to keep goldenrod from taking over your whole garden by having these beetles on it. And this is what the larvae look like. And this is another beetle, beautiful, beautiful. About 15 years ago when Frank's nursery was open in Minnesota, they would sell these nine barks. Diablo is a dark color, purple leaf, um, a yellow leafed one, a little leafed one. and None of them survived. The only one that survives is the native nine bark. But again, this chrysomela beetle, same as this, the chrysomela beetle, it would feed on nine barks. And here we have uh, another beetle, and this one is the viburnum beetle. And so here we have, um, this one isn't native. It's been brought in from Europe, but this one is native, this one's native. And because they are managed by ladybird beetle eating their eggs or ants eating their eggs, they can create a local population that you may have to spray in your backyard, but it is never a big issue like Japanese beetle. So this life history of insects, so the chrysomela beetles, you never have to manage them. Their life history, we started out with the first slide talking about chrysomelids, here's some more. Even though some are exotic, some are native, they never need to be managed because that egg stage, they lay these bright eggs on leaves and every insect in the world wants to eat them. Where Japanese beetle hide their eggs in the turf, nobody can get them but the soil inhabiting fungus, so they reach high population size. So I started out by talking about morphological characters to help you identify insects to families, which is conservative. And here we go, ending up on this slide, um, talking about, again, how management is, IPM management is really related to the family of insects. I wanna do five more slides here, okay? And um, wanna talk not a lot about this, but 
why does emerald ash borer cause such problems? Well, it's an exotic. It lays its eggs under the bark. Nobody can find the eggs to eat. Our ash trees don't have the right chemical like the ash trees in Asia to kill the larvae. So that's why emerald ash borer. Borers are always a problem if the host plant is susceptible because nobody can get at the eggs or the larvae to eat them because they're under the bark. The same thing here. This is a really giant longhorn beetle um, called the Asian longhorn beetle. And again, nobody can uh, control this without really getting in. They actually just chop down the trees. That's how big a problem because they lay their eggs under the bark and there's really not anything, uh, maybe woodpeckers, but they don't get enough insects to, to, to control them. All right, um, here we go to the scarabs. I just want to remind you there's a bunch of families, but they do all, all the do, do the same thing. Look here at these antennae. And there was something in the last two years, European chafer is going to be a big problem in Minnesota. Um, European chafer is a problem in climates that are warmer, Indiana, southern Michigan. Um, I do not think it's ever going to be a problem here like Japanese beetle. Um, it doesn't do the same thing as Japanese beetle. It doesn't feed on so many hosts. Actually, the adults don't even feed. So it lays less eggs. And so I don't think it's going to be the management issue. But just remember, here's these family scarabia day. The morphological character you use are these antennae, clubbed antennae. All of them have it. And that gives you an information on what they feed on during their life stage and whether they're difficult to control. So I just want to do three more slides, bear with me. This is a slide about scale insects and um, two things. Japanese beetle came from Asia, it came to the United States in 1916. This uh, fungus is controlling it in the East. It's slowly spreading and we're trying to spread the fungus around to control it. It's gotten into airports and planes, pick them up. They get into the wheels, the plane lands in Italy. And there's problems now with Japanese beetle over in Italy. Pine tortoise shell scale is a huge issue. These are, if you can see this, this is people on buckets on these uh, pine trees in Rome, near the Colosseum in the backyard. They're killing these <coughs> umbrella pines. So we can cause problems with invasives to other areas. Uh, monarch butterflies are uh, all over the world. People have found them so charismatic. They, taken them and released them. I would never say they're a pest. They just need to feed on a plant in the Apocynaceae family, which is what milkweed's in. So summary here, IPM is a decision-making process with many tactics. Organic management doesn't count because organic pesticides like pyrethrins are highly toxic. You need a biorational. You got to go to that table, figure out the good biorationals to use based on the LC50 to honeybees and that you have to know insect morphology to be able to tell what family it is. Insect evolution is very conservative. And if you know the family, you can predict if it's gonna be a pest problem or not. Please use my website to diagnose insects. That book is there with 300 different entries. Um, it does landscapes, not gardens. So Jeff's book did gardens, mine does not do gardens. And then there's information about pesticides there. There's information like I said, that beautiful section on insect, um, butterfly, beneficial insect identification. So I'd love to answer some questions. Ninety-nine people, holy camoly. And if you would put your questions in the chat, please. Vera, this is Pat Peshman. Um, there is one question about where do they find that um, information about the biorationals? Can you? So if you go to that website, there's that leaflet I showed you. It's practically okay. on every page. And in most of the bulletins, it's in the bulletin too. So you, there's all kinds of bulletins for IPM and landscapes, IPM and naturalized areas, and that information. So everything I told you is today is in those bulletins on that website. Okay. Um, do you have some favorite, I'm not sure what 
Forbes for bee lawns. Favorite? Oh, flavored Forbes. So Forbes are just flowering plants, right? Oh, okay. Forbes. Sorry. Somebody yeah. with a British background is in the audience. <laughs> um, so my favorite Forbes are Creeping Charlie. I know you're going to stone me. Good thing we're on Zoom here. Um, that self heal they talk about to use in bee lawns. It's in the mint family, like uh, Creeping Charlie. Creeping Charlie, you know, it. it's not a bad plant. The bees use the pollen and nectar from it. It's not a perfect bee plant. So yes, there is a one I like, and it's called Blanket Flower. Um, blanket Flower, does anybody know the genus? It's Ganzania, I think, is the genus. It's a pest in Kansas. And I like... Um, Dutch clover is what I put in my backyard. So when you mow Dutch clover, plants actually are much smarter than you and I think. And when they grow their stem the next time, it's shorter so that your mower doesn't take off the flower. And that ganzania that I'm talking about, that blanket family, that's a native flower to prairies, to short grass prairies. It's on, not on the list but the bee lab, but that would be my favorite to look for blanket flower. Creeping time. So if you go to the website, I have some suggestions from British bee lawns. So you can look that up on that website too. Wonderful. So um, Terry is asking, should you always treat ash trees even if they're healthy and 20 plus years old? Any risks of professionally treating ash trees regarding using leaves for compost, kids playing in those leaves? Yeah, so what they've switched now from the neonics is to this enemic and benzoate, which was good. Because enemic benzoate is a very water insoluble molecule. And it actually took 10 years of using enemic and benzoate for emerald ash borer to come up with this, a new formulation that's more water, water soluble. What that means is less of it is gonna move into pollen and nectar because the molecule is very big and hard to move. Now, now that I say that, is there data out there to prove that? The data is hard to find because you have to get somebody to fund this and it's really hard to get agencies to fund this kind of work. But our ash trees in Minnesota um, are not gonna survive even though it might look pretty good still without you treating it. And if it's a nice looking ash tree, you're eventually gonna have to treat it. So as soon as you start to see some decline, you're gonna have to treat it. You might be able to wait two or three years um, usually if you treat it, it lasts two years. You don't have to, you can do it every other year. And I would pick a good, you know, one of the better companies. There is not a lot of data that it's hurting the ash. They, they've gotten all these new micro injection systems that work really nicely. The original ones did kill like a side of a tree. It caused collapsing of the phloem, but they don't see that anymore. And so if you want to keep your favorite ash, you're going to have to eventually treat it. And the leaves from the ash, treated ash trees, are they safe for pets and children? So again, this endomectin benzoate is, I have not said any research on that. If you gave me $200,000, I'd love to do that for you. <laughs> it's expensive work to figure that out. And I will go look tomorrow and see if there's any new papers, but I don't think so because I think it's bound up into the leaf. And then you're gonna ask what happens when the leaf decomposes. It should turn into moieties, which mean into the molecule should break up into less toxic forms. But I have to look up leaves. I, I actually don't know that answer. So um, okay, Thank email you. me if you want, if you in a week, email me um, and I'll have the answer for you if I can find a paper on that. Um, so Catherine has a question. She said, I've heard earthworms aren't native. Oh my goodness. Yes, Catherine, you have <laughs> heard the, you have heard the banging of the drums, right? So let's get a picture. I could talk for another hour. I have pictures for you. So yes, uh, you know, Lee Freilich is in the forestry department and he's the one that said earthworms shouldn't be in Minnesota. The glacier killed them all. The European settlers brought them back and they go into forests and they turn the soil and then they kill seedlings. Well, he didn't know about jumping worms. So jumping worms now come from Asia. We think they got here because they were sold as bait because they move a lot. 
I find them in the backyard all the time. The robins love them. They bite them in half and there's this half a worm jiggling because they're much bigger than usually the worms in August. They overwinter as cocoons so in the early spring, you don't see them. So you have earthworms in the spring, they're not jumping worms. But these jumping worms, you can tell here, this clitellum here, see it's sunken in and it's closer to the head. But I find them everywhere. So it's a complex issue. They occur in high numbers. The soil turns to what looks like coffee grounds, but also everybody in the forest is eating them. You know, there's not a lot of food in the forest by August. And so every and so what it prevents is prevents recruitment of little trees and stuff, which is a big issue. So yes, it is a huge issue. We could talk about that sometime if you want me to come back. I have a proposal in on jumping worms. So we can talk about that sometimes if you want. You are right, it's an issue. What can you do? You can try not to move it around. That right now it's not a quarantine pest in Minnesota, but everybody is trying to figure out how they can stop it from spreading. It is in some nursery stock and those growers are working very hard to not to spread it. So it is an issue. Okay, thank you. Do you see any risk of Dutch white clover being invasive? Yeah, so um, um, like zombies, huh? No, I see no zero risk. Um, I have Dutch white clover. It's been on one side of my lawn that gets more shade. So the grass isn't as vigorous. It's been there 30 years now. One side has none that's in the full sun and where it's, so the house shades it more. It's more mostly Dutch clover. It is a really good for kids to play on or dogs or cats has very fibrous roots that hold the soil together. Um, so I, I grew up with Dutch clover back in, I'm an old person, back in the fifties when your dad handed you a bag of, you know, bag of grass seed and you went and filled in all the holes from the winter, it all contained glass grass. The grass seeds all contain Dutch clover because it's nitrogen fixing. It wasn't until we accepted this paradigm that we all have to use herbicides, 1950 paradigm that we all believed we have to kill every weed with the herbicide um that they stopped putting dutch clover in seed mixes because it would be killed so no i do not see a problem with dutch clover out competing grasses no okay good to know patricia is asking so is the japanese beetle spray sold at nurseries toxic to bees oh i don't know what's in it so patricia send me an email tell me what's in it i'd love to know all right. And Don is asking, what would you suggest for scale insects, particularly well, magnolia scale? Yes, yeah, so that is a big Minnesota issue and one of my favorite pests. So um, it is an armored scale, which means it puts its mouth part in a different place than like you get a scale on that Benjamin fig, you know, the, those scales you see that are soft scales. And so what happens is it puts its mouth part in a place that when they inject enamectin benzoate in a tree, it doesn't reach it right. But you can control it if you have your, do not cut your, so the tree industry in Minnesota is saying, cut down your magnolias. I just, you know, I could grow, grow screaming around my neighborhood if somebody told me to do that. So do not cut, that, cut down your magnolia. What you wanna do is you put two-sided tape out and the scales, when they come out from under the dead female's body, they'll be pink, bright pink like a uh, raspberry pink and you look at them and then spray neem oil. And that's gonna help you out a bit. Or if you need to spray a conventional, you can spray a pyrethrin or a pyrethroid on the bark and kill them. But don't cut down your magnolia. It is a problem, it is a problem. But if you have a pet tree and you wanna save it, you can save it, I promise you. Ms. Joanna um, shared a link to I think pictures of blanket flowers for everyone, if you want to look in the chat. I'd like to thank you, Vera, for a wonderful presentation. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight. Sherry, any other comments? No, no I, I uh, was going to say the exact same thing, Pat. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and we would love to have you back for another presentation. So We'll be talking to you and see what else we can come up with. Sure, they're, they're, they're really, I have double the slides. I could go on and talk some more. We could have ideas <laughs> too, if you want. But yes, that's it, blanket flower.
beautiful. And when you plant it in your lawn and then you cut the grass, again, the flower gets shorter and it will, will, will be under the mower height next time. It's a beautiful flower and the bees love it. Great. Well, again, thank you so much.